I don't know about you, but this feels like one of the weirdest Father's Days I can remember. I drove recently a hundred miles to see my dad in lockdown, but because of social distancing, I couldn't give him a hug. It's so weird, isn't it? So many of us are distanced from our loved ones and our families right now. Holding on to hope in the middle of this crisis can be really difficult. And so it's important, isn't it, on Father's Day that we think about people that might be having a particularly tough time right now. And my heart at the moment has been with little Gianna Floyd. I don't know if you saw the videos of her. She's a six-year-old. And uh, her famous speech, or well, one-sentence speech, was, My daddy is changing the world. Do you know who she is? Do you recognise that surname? Floyd. She is George Floyd's young daughter. And this must be the most difficult Father's Day I could imagine for her. She is now without a dad in her life because her dad, as we all know, was killed by a white police officer. And we saw, sadly, the world has seen the last eight minutes and 40 seconds of George Floyd's life. And I don't know how she is not going to end up seeing that video at some stage in her life. And I can't imagine the damage that's going to do to her. And so I, I guess in the middle of this global pandemic, there's a another issue that's come to the fore. It's to do with racial disparity, how black people don't feel safe. They can't trust that when they meet a police officer, they're going to be treated fairly. Black people are afraid of the police because too many black men in particular have been killed by white police officers. What a mess. And it feels like the world is waking up to that and saying this is out of order, that this cannot be allowed to go on. And so on the streets of Oxford and London and Melbourne and Brussels and in 47 other countries around the world, people have been saying enough is enough and we need to do something. And actually Christians need to be involved in this movement because at its heart, it's a movement that was started by Christians. You remember Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King was a Baptist minister. And as a person who believed in the Bible, all of his speeches were infused by this, this prophetic call to justice that is on every page of scripture. And so we don't have to endorse everything that comes under the Black Lives Matter banner but we do need to add our voice when it coheres and aligns with what the bible says about the intrinsic dignity of all human beings so this is a tough father's day and it's tough for many of us but i think it's going to be tough for many children particularly black children whose dads most likely or maybe their parents have suffered at the hands of police brutality and so this father's day i think we need to be thinking of them and i want you to hear actually that this attention to vulnerable people is a very biblically important message and it's one that we need to latch on to in father's day and have a look at psalm 68 that's the psalm i'm going to use to think about some of these issues and i guess you need to be warned i'm going to call you to some action about how you can respond to a crisis going through our nation right now what it is that you could do to align yourself with god's heart his concern for justice his concern for the vulnerable but if you've got a bible please open it up whether you're a new christian someone exploring faith uh, or someone who's been a christian for a long time um, it's important that you know that the bible is like the true north for christians it's how we align ourselves with what god is doing it's a bit like you know seafarers and navigators trying to find their way in the world they look for the north star and then they set sail don't they and so for christians wanting to know how to live in these complicated times we check with the scriptures and they become the true north by which we orientate and set the sail of our lives and so it's important that every church is biblically founded and so looking at this psalm this song from the middle of the bible will help us get connected with what God is about and what God's doing in the universe. And it's a strange psalm. Have a look at how it opens up. Psalm 68, verse 1. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God, and may they be happy and joyful. 
It's pretty full on hardcore psalm, isn't it? This is a song, a national song, a song that Israel would have sung every time they moved the Ark of the Covenant. And I don't know about you, every time I hear the word Ark of the Covenant, there's only one place my imagination goes. It's back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. That, that's where my mind goes immediately. It's Indiana Jones chasing down the Ark of the Covenant. He's trying to get it before the Nazis get it because he knows that they know that the Ark of the Covenant had an important role to play in the nation of Israel's military conquest. And what the Nazis think is if they can get this Ark of the Covenant in front of their uh, advancing panzer divisions, then they'll win the war. Nazis might not have read enough of the Bible to know that's a problem, but still, that's their idea. That's their kind of folklore, legend idea of the Ark of the Covenant. And so this is the song that Israel would sing before they moved their Ark of the Covenant. I had a friend uh, when we lived in Albania, he was part of the tank division and uh, his name was Roland. He's actually been uh, given a really high honour within NATO recently. But when I knew him, he was just a student. He was studying to be a, a tank commander. And he said a core part of their day was singing. They would sing songs to keep up their spirits. And throughout history, there have been songs that have helped soldiers keep fighting in the middle of wars. Or there are songs that they sing when they're parading. And most of those songs are normally about how great the country that they are serving is. How they're going to defeat all their foes. How God is on our side and God will help us win our battles. And... At first, you might think this is where this song is going. This is the song that Israel sings when they move what some people thought was their weapon of mass destruction, their Ark of the Covenant. And they're asking for God to arise and for his enemies to be scattered, foes to be fleeing before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. Again, my mind goes to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you remember when they finally open the Ark of the Covenant? The angel of death comes out and it melts everybody that looks at it. Luckily, Indiana Jones and his girlfriend keep their eyes closed because they've somehow come to the conclusion that's a good way to avoid the angel of death. If they'd read a bit of the Bible, they might have been more likely to paint blood over their doorposts. But still, closing your eyes, good start. And uh, everyone melts and the Nazis all die. It's all pretty full on in, in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it sounds like this is what this song's going to be about. It's like, God, he's our God. If you're one of our enemies, watch out. Our God's going to melt you. And, and too often when we think about God and our nation, we always think God is like our mascot. He's going to blitz our enemies. You know, in warfare, you could do what you like because God's on your side and he'll make it happen. Well, you'll, you'll know from the history of Israel that's not what happened with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not a sure deal of Israel winning battle. So God doesn't give them a kind of surefire win in every circumstance. But here, Israel is asking God to be with them. You say, look, would God arise? Would, would he be involved in this fight? Because we are unable to fight on our own. So it sounds quite militaristic. It quite, sounds quite like nationalistic. But then the psalm takes a really powerful turn and hopefully it will make sense to you while we're looking at it today on Father's Day. Verse 4. Sing to God. Sing praise to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord and rejoice before him. So far, so normal. You know, our God's God. He's big. He, he rides on clouds. He's bigger than any other God. But then he says this. Verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling god sets the lonely in families he leads forth the prisoners with singing so that's interesting isn't it this doesn't sound like your classic nationalistic hymn where we're going to win watch out don't be our enemy god's going to destroy you no the god that israel followed was a god who was at his heart compassionate and gracious who took time to care for those who were widowed or orphaned. So that's not the kind of God that just destroys enemies uh, willy-nilly. This is a God who's driven by a sense of compassion and justice and mercy and kindness. That's who God is. I don't know about you, I've met people who, when they 
meet you. They want to tell you they're important and they do it by name dropping. Name dropping maybe the last meeting they came from or someone important they've met once a long time ago. And they name drop those people because they're so insecure they have to ride off of the glory of other people. But listen, who does God name drop in this psalm? He name drops the widow and the orphan, the marginalised, those that are the poor in society, those that had no power in society. That is who God name drops because he wants you to know those are the people that he's especially concerned for. God shows particular attention to the most vulnerable in society because that's the kind of God he is. He is a father to the fathers and a protector of widows and orphans. Now, why is God so concerned about those people? It's not that these people are more important than others. We believe that God loves everyone. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world. Every single person on this planet is loved by God. That means you, if you're just visiting this service, you're just kind of flicking through Facebook or social media and you've come across this service, God loves you. That means gay people. That means straight people. That means black people. That means white people. That means trans people. That means anyone on this planet is loved by God. Now, we haven't responded to God's love appropriately, but everyone on this planet is loved by God. But God says, look, I have particular interest in the vulnerable because I'll take up the cause of people that everyone else is ignoring. I'll take up the cause of people who are in danger of being oppressed or um, impoverished. I'll take up those people's cause because that's the kind of God I am. I am a God of compassion and mercy, says the God. What does this mean for Father's Day? Well, it's quite simple. In the UK today, there are thousands of children who don't have parents involved in their lives. 70% of the children in care have been removed from their birth parents because of neglect or abuse. Something catastrophic has happened to them and so they need to come into the care of the state. And we need more foster families to come forward to care for them. On top of that, there's 3,000 children who are waiting to be adopted. That means they can never go back to their birth families. They're going to need somewhere permanent to live forever. And so we need to find thousands more adoptive parents to come forward. And you might think, oh, Chris, that's crazy. Those numbers, that's way beyond our church's ability to help. Well, we did the maths of churches like yours that love and care about Jesus and want to pursue justice. There's about 15,000 churches. Did you do the maths? 9,000 more families needed for fostering and about 3,000 children waiting to be adopted. We don't need every Christian to adopt or foster 10 children. We just need one new family to come forward to foster or adopt per church, the rest of the church to wrap around them and we can meet the entire need right now. Well, here are three amazing things that will happen if we did that. Firstly, these kids will find the love and care and compassion that they need. If you're in foster care in the UK, there's some really hard statistics to fight against for your future. Our prison population is between 40 and 50 percent care experience. That means you're more likely to end up in prison if you've had experience in care than any other group in society. Homeless people. 25 percent of the homeless population are young people that have aged out of foster care. And sadly, in some areas, our sex workers and prostitutes, 70% of them are young women who have aged out of care. Do you see how if we don't help kids when they come into care to find the love and support they need, we, we meet them again in other areas that the church is interested in. We're interested in homelessness. We're interested in ending sex trafficking we're interested in in helping people in prisons but we could help them not when the systems chewed them out and spat them out but when they're a five-year-old in need of a loving family so we'd love it if the church could step forward to care for these children secondly if we do this we begin to be the church that models the love and grace of god did you see it in that psalm God describes himself as a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows and orphans. This is who God is. This is the very nature of God. And if we're going to claim that we want to be godly Christians, we want to walk in the character and footsteps of our God, then caring for vulnerable people must matter. It says God sets the lonely in families. Where are these orphaned and widowed people going to end up in a family? Whose family is it? 
but it could be your family, it could be my family. God's going to use the families of his people to provide the hope and help and hospitality that these widows and orphans need. Now, we don't use the word orphan about children in care right now because most of them do have living parents and we want to honour the, uh, the good parts of the parenting that those birth parents have done. But the language still applies. Children not living under the protection of their father is how we should translate that word orphan into modern language. And so there are, as you know, thousands of children who are needing loving families right now in the UK. Could it be your family that responds? The third thing we'll do is we'll begin to signal to the nation what the church is all about. It says in, in Matthew's gospel that we should let our light shine, that they may see our good deeds and praise our father in heaven. Friends, I don't know of a more visible good deed that you could be doing that would demonstrate the kind of God we serve than welcoming vulnerable children into your home as a foster parent or an adoptive parent. This is to model the heart of God to our nation right now. And boy, do we need it. We needed it before COVID struck, but we know that there's going to be a massive spike of kids coming into care once restrictions are lifted and maybe kids are back in school again because these kids have been invisible. And so we'd ask you to consider whether God might be calling you to start the journey to become a foster parent or an adoptive parent. Here's a little opportunity for you right now. Uh, you're going to need a smartphone, not one that you're currently watching this on, but another one. And if you put it on camera mode and then point it at the screen, there's going to be what we call a QR code popping up right here. And that QR code, if you use it on the camera, is going to take you to a website where you can put in your name and your email. If you follow that link, you'll help me in a powerful way. We get to speak to, by the grace of God, Downing Street, the Department for Education. And if I go there saying hundreds of Christians are behind us, look, we've got their email addresses. They pray for us because they care about vulnerable children. That really helps me when I go there to say the church is behind this. But I'd love to help you too. We will send you loads of prayer information so you can find out how you can play your part in praying for kids in care. It will give you a link also later on about how you might start the process if you're interested in fostering adoption. And maybe some of you are considering giving to our work because we're a tiny charity, crazy vision. We want to find a home for every child that needs one. And as a little bit of fun, uh, there'll also be a little prize draw. If you're theologically OK with that, we're going to pick a few people at random from who fill in the... Um, the email and uh, we'll send them a copy of uh, my book God is Stranger uh, which is all about kind of radical hospitality. It's been a pleasure to join you this morning and on Father's Day as we think of young Guyana Floyd living without her dad, as we think of thousands of children in care who don't know who their forever families are going to be. They're not going to see their mum or their dad today because they're in foster care or they're in institutional care or they're far away from their birth parents. They need ongoing loving families. Could you be that family? Could you be that single person that's willing to step forward to care for these children? Could they experience the Father's love, our Heavenly Father's love, the father who is a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows and orphans. Could they experience that through your love and care? Thank you so much for listening. Look forward to hearing from you soon.